All right, so we've given people some time. I'm sure we'll have uh, others filter in as we move along, but I don't wanna delay any longer. I know our presenters have a really great topic for us today and a lot of great information, uh, so we'll get started. Uh, it is my honor to be moderating our event today. Uh, I'm Dr. Ben Freer, uh, a co-chair of the NGO Committee on the Family. My co-chair is running technology support, Ryan Coe. And thank you to our great EC members who are with us as well and who organize this event. Um, welcome all to this parallel event of the NGO Commission of, on the Status of Women being held by the NGO Committee on the Family uh, entitled He for She in the Family, uh, sorry, He for She at Home, Gender Equality and the Family. This session will explore how the family, the natural fundamental group unit of society can be a source of women and girls empowerment. The session will explore how the family empowers women and girls, particularly when gender equality is valued by men within the family. Additionally, father support for the daughter's education nurture not only girls' abilities, but also their confidence. We'll examine policies and practices which can help families combat harmful stereotypes and practices and foster a future in which women and girls participate equally and successfully in public life. We are honored to have two amazing speakers, Drs. Cowan and Cowan. Uh, Dr. Carolyn Cowan is adjunct psychology professor emeritus uh, from UC Berkeley. She co-directed three longitudinal intervention studies of how family relationships affect children's adaptation. Co-author of When Partners oh, Become oh, Parents, oh, the Big Life Change for Couples, and co-editor of Fatherhood Today, Men's Changing Role in the Family in the Family Context of Parenting and Children's Adaptation to Elementary School. Dr. Cowan consults internationally about the development, evaluation, and policy implications of family intervention results. Uh, additionally, we have Dr. Philip Cowan, who is per, uh, psychology professor emeritus from UC Berkeley. He served as director of the clinical psychology program in the Institute of Human Development and co-directed three longitudinal intervention studies of links between family relationship quality and children's development. He's the author of Piaget with Feeling and co-author When Partners Become Parents, The Big Life Change for Couples. We'll have to wonder who the uh, co-authors right, are of that wonderful book um, and co-author of four additional books and monographs and numerous scientific articles on the implications for family policies. So with no further ado, I turn it over to Drs. Cowens uh, and thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you very much, Ben. And it's an honor to be here. And we're just really excited to talk to this group, especially uh, about the family. <clears throat> so um, our title, the, the way it had been given was he for she and the family. Gender equality starts at home, but we're going to say that it really doesn't end there. And we're going to take a very systemic view of how girls develop and uh, develop and do well in yeah. their relationship lives and in society. So we're talking about how families can combat the harmful gender stereotypes and practices that are still really evident, especially in Western culture and probably throughout the world. Maybe some of you will talk more about that. We want to help foster a future in which women and girls participate equally and successfully in public life. And so we start with a girl. And that girl often in many families has a brother. And the kids have a mother who, and, uh, who is a parent. And one of the questions will be how they treat girls and how they treat boys. But where we want to come in is to say that often in families, there is a father or a father figure or a central or a second parent. And we're also going to talk about the fact that the relationship between those parents really has an effect on both how boys and girls develop. And then the systemic part of what we're talking about is, of course, there's the workplace, which is still highly gendered. And there's public services, which we'll talk about, which is highly gender stereotyped. 
and there are the policy decision makers at city, county, um, state, national, country level, uh, making decisions and still in a, a gender stereotyped way. And all of these go into the making of a girl's self-esteem, competence, um, adjustment. So what we're gonna do, and Carolyn and I will kind of alternate speaking here to talk about the development of girls and boys. We're gonna talk about the importance of fathers, the importance of the couple relationship quality, the importance of having a couples-based fatherhood intervention approach to strengthening families, and then finally talk about the implications for the workplace, for family services, for research and policy. So I'm gonna start by talking about the importance of father involvement. And here, I mean positive father involvement first. I mean a father who is actively engaged daily in, uh, in uh, parenting of the children, or if they're living separately or divorced, still actively engaged in contact with the child, being accessible to the child and the other no. caregivers, being responsible for the child's care. No. I heard a comment, I'm not sure. Uh, what we don't mean is we're not talking about abusive or violent fathers. We're not saying that fathers have to be in the home no matter what. And we don't mean that the child has to have female and male parents. We're really talking about a second positive co-parent who works collaboratively with the mother, or there can be two female parents, two male parents, what we say we believe applies to all, but we're gonna start by focusing on males, on fathers, and talk about the fact that thousands of studies really show this, that having a positive father involvement, either in the home or just with the child, leads to greater satisfaction with the relationship for the mother, less depression and anxiety for the mothers, it certainly is associated with better cognitive language, social development for kids, better grades, a stronger sense of self-esteem, less depression. <clears throat> and being an active, positively involved father has benefits for the dad's health and the dad's well-being as well. There are some specific benefits for daughters. Daughters who believe that the fathers believe in them and support their learning. Again, have a lot of good things that you can see on the slide. Higher self-esteem, they do better in school. They, they, when they grow up, tend to have a more positive and long lasting romantic relationships or marriages. And um, what they have in the home when the father is as involved or actively involved along with the mother they have positive examples of how they can expect men to treat women. Now, in order to um, help fathers be involved, there really are two kinds of interventions that we're familiar. One is parenting classes that help both men and women. And the other is fatherhood interventions, interventions specifically for, for the men. But when we look at parenting classes and we look at what's missing, we find that the men are missing because even though they say that fathers are welcome and in therapeutic interventions too, what we find is that about 90% of the parents participating in these programs are mothers. So the men are missing from parenting programs and they're getting the message sometimes that they're not really as important in the parenting of the child, girls or boys. Now, a lot of people tell us when we talk about this, well, yeah, but there's so many single mother families, you're just talking about fathers. And we think that single mothers and in England, lone mothers, that's not really the right term because typically mothers are involved with a co-parent of some kind. It may be an unmarried man, it may be an unmarried woman, it may be a grandmother, it may be a friend. Um, it may be another kind of family member, an aunt or uncle. But when fathers are seen by social services, 
we find that fathers' names aren't listed on social service case files. They're not invited to meetings. So even when there's a so-called single mother, there's usually some other parent in, involved, but social service agencies tend to ignore that. So starting in the 1980s, what happened was that there was a concern, especially in the United States, about the fact that fathers, especially low-income fathers, were slipping away from the family. So there tended to be, there's tended to be started fatherhood interventions, usually men's groups of men led by male leaders. And what was missing from that, we think, is the couple, that is the other parent. <clears throat> so what we want to move to now is talking about what's the importance of that relationship, the relationship of the father and the mother of the child. Carol? Uh, so um, I'm going to focus a little bit on um, what we've been learning. Uh, Phil and I have been working with families, uh, mostly with parents of babies and young children for more than 40 years. And what we've found is some evidence for the importance of the quality of the relationship between the parents. So why is couple relationship quality important to children's well-being? Well, our years of uh, research and evaluating intervention studies um, and work by Gordon Harold in England and Mark Cummings and Patrick Davies in the United States and now many others make it clear that unresolved couple conflict, especially in front of the children, predicts children's aggression, hyperactivity, their depression, their social withdrawal, and their academic problems. There are many, many studies that show this. And the emphasis here is on unresolved couple conflict. We know that couples in their relationships will quite naturally over time have issues that they disagree about or have conflict about. And what we're talking about is disagreements or conflict that doesn't ever get resolved. And this is what the atmosphere that the children are growing up in. And then because our work started with couples who were becoming parents for the first time, what we've learned and many, many studies now across many in industrialized countries have shown this, uh, a sad but important fact. And that is when couples become parents, especially for the first time and don't have any particular intervention to help them through that time, the couple relationship and the, the satisfaction with it tends to decline after the baby is born. And studies that have gone on further and followed families further have suggested that it continues to decline for at least the next 15 years until those kids are um, teenagers. We, do, we don't want to scare you with this, but on the average, it does tend to be true. And why is this a problem? Well, parents distressed in their relationship as a couple, many other studies have shown, has a negative effect on the children's development, their intellectual development, their social development, and their emotional development and, and you know their time with peers. So this is why we're focusing on that. And we um, are going to talk about a new evidence-based integrative approach that takes all these things into account. So it's a family systems view of factors that are related to how the parents do and how the children do. And these factors can be risk factors if they're not well worked out or they're in distress, or they can be protective factors if they do uh, work. And what we've been focusing on are five um, aspects of family life in these interventions. And um, first, we focus on the parents as individuals, their health, their mental health, how they manage to meet their individual needs. Then we focus on a lot on the parent-child relationships, both the fathers and the mothers, parenting strategies, how age appropriate are they? We talk about providing some warmth, some structure, some demands for maturity that are appropriate to the child's age, and some reasonable limit setting based on the child's age and stage. Um, and then we focus quite a bit on the couple relationship about how the parents manage their conflict and disagreement and trying to help 
their co-parenting be more collaborative and not undermining each other's strategies with the kids. And then another thing that we focus on a great deal um, because it gets left out of a lot of talk about parenting is the parents' own developmental histories with their parents. So what are they carrying over from the past? And if there were cycles of harsh treatment or abuse and neglect, how can they now in their current families interrupt those intergenerational cycles, which tend to get repeated if there is no um, special help with that? And finally, the fifth aspect of family life that, that our, our interventions focus on has to do with the stressors that the families are facing and any supports that they have to address them. So the parent strategies for coping with uh, external stressors um, from um, the neighborhood, from work or lack of work, um, and um, trying to help them enlist support, both from family and friends in the workplace, and social services that are available to them uh, so that um, we can address all these parts of the family. So it's not just the couple relationship. It's not just father involvement, but we feel we have to attend to these five uh, factors that, as I say, can be either risks or protective for children's optimal development. And here's a, just a very simple graphic that tells you what it is we're trying to focus on in our work. Um, you can see the, the um, grandparents in the top uh, right and left corners. Um, and this, in this case, it, it's uh, depicting a heterosexual couple, but the same would be true um, of a, a gay or lesbian couple. They each bring something from those relationships. They develop a relationship as a couple. They each develop a relationship with the child. And of course, the parents hopefully go to work, they have friends, um, the kids go to school and have peers, and the social support and life stress that's impinging on the family are all playing a part in how the children ultimately do in their development. So um, the intervention approach that we're recommending includes both fathers and mothers. It helps to strengthen the relationship between the parents. Um, it helps to strengthen parenting both for the father with the child or children and the mother. It encourages more conscious choices of relationship patterns in this generation, the family right now, and, and also tries to maintain strong generational ties. So we've been um, intervening with groups for partners and parents. And each group, this is this again is over 40 years in many, many different locales. Each group has either five or six couples, or in some cases, we tried fathers only groups since they were quite popular in this country for a long time, or eight to 10 dads. And it, when possible, a male female co leader pair who've had some training, and then we train them as well to work with couple and parent child relationships. We typically have two hour meetings every week. Um, in our first study of couples becoming parents for the first time, we started when they were still in pregnancy and it actually went for 24 weeks until the babies were about three months old. But now, more recently, we do interventions that are 16 weeks long and they're for parents of children from birth to adolescence. And our groups um, sort of started with a radical idea. Um, it was our idea that parents don't need to be told what to do or what not to do by teaching parenting relationship skills in a lecture format, but rather that they will respond, and we're finding that they definitely do, to some kind of help to get them closer to the kind of parents and partners they're wanting to be. And if offered a safe group format that invites them to look at their own values, try some new strategies and learn what works best for them, both from each other and from the skilled leaders and from other people in the group, um, usually it's quite successful in helping them get closer to what they're trying to do. So um, the curriculum um, in, in typically has an open-ended check-in every week that's unstructured. So parents can bring any issue that they're working on, struggling with, a success they had in the last week. And then the rest of the meeting um, includes a theme um, uh, based on one of the five risk or protective factors that we've been talking about. 
sometimes a short presentation by the facilitators or um, a video or a, a little piece of a movie that stimulates talking about these things. Some exercises like role playing a particular parenting strategy or a particular couple communication style so they can really get into how it feels to be doing things that way and everyone else is observing and able to comment. And some discussion quite explicitly about what each one is hoping to revise from their family of origin patterns. Um, occasionally, um, we've suggested uh, in each group we do over time um, a bit of homework, such as, okay, next week, plan a date that has to do with your relationship as a couple. No kids come along on this date, and but you can't spend more than two dollars or two pounds or two euros, depending which country you're in. Uh, so it has to be a very low cost. Um, and the, the original ideas that these couples come up with are absolutely spellbinding and um, uh, quite inspiring. So I'm going to talk about some of the results of these. So what happens when you do this? And the first study we did in starting in 1975 was, as Carolyn said, becoming a family with couples who are pregnant and uh, with a first child. And then we followed them over time, as you'll see. And um, so one of the main findings from this, Carolyn had talked about the fact that on the average satisfaction with your relationship goes down after having a baby. Again, we randomly assigned some, we didn't assign them to having babies or not, you can't do that. But we did assign them to being pregnant in a group or pregnant not in a group and they could have services, whatever, whatever it was that they needed. So here were the couples that were having a baby without an intervention. And as Carolyn implied, over time, by the time the kids were in kindergarten, entering elementary school, about half of them in a, um, a standardized survey of marital satisfaction were similar to couples who were having trouble and in therapy. So that shows again that on the average satisfaction with the couple relationship declines. But for the couples who were in our groups um, who had this 16 week intervention, by the time the kids were in kindergarten, on the average, there was a, a kind of stability. They, they were about the same level. We would have liked to even increase their satisfaction, but the fact that we were able to maintain it against the odds we thought was pretty terrific. On the basis of that, we started a new study uh, with a, another group of parents who Again, with the first child, they were entering elementary, their kids were entering elementary school. And we followed them till the kids were in high school. And this one was had another wrinkle. We had some couples in a control group, but we had two groups of two kinds of couples groups. In the first one, we focused a lot on parenting. And in the second group, with the same kind of curriculum, we focused a little bit more, especially in the open-ended part, on the parents' relationship. And here's what we found. For the couples in the parenting focus, what happened was that over time, as we observed it, when they were interacting with their kids, they were less harsh, uh, less structured, less uh, crabby, less limit-setting, uh, less uh, and especially the tone was less harsh, so that was good. Uh, the kids in elementary school, as seen by their teachers, were less depressed and they felt better about themselves. But when we looked at the groups, the same kind of groups with a couple focus, we found that the couples had less conflict and less volatility and a little bit less violence and their harsh parenting declined and their kids one and two years later or actually up to grade four were less aggressive and uh, had higher achievement on achievement tests. So again, the couple focus seems to be, it's not just parenting. When you think about 
a strengthening kids. You think about parenting, but what we think about is trying to shore up the whole family as a system, the nuclear family, and uh, making it possible for the parents to uh, do better as, as parents. There were some specific outcomes for daughters here to get back to our topic at the beginning. The mother's harsh parenting was uh, related to the more likely the daughters were being depressed. The father's harsh parenting was more likely to have the daughters be more aggressive in school as the teachers saw. And these effects lasted actually for 10 years from the child's transition to elementary school to their transition to high school. So we think that the group has quite a bit of power. But these studies so far were for working class and middle class families. But the Department of Child Abuse Prevention uh, in the early 2000s came to us and said, look, we're concerned about in low income families, fathers uh, less connected with their kids leaving the home uh, would you want to have an intervention for them? And we said, yes, if the intervention, again, involved both parents. And in association with our friends and colleagues, Marsha Pruitt and Kyle Pruitt, and a long-term data manager, Peter Gillette, we developed the Supporting Father Involvement Project. Again, 16 weeks of groups meeting together. And the first one, uh, we had 289 couples, low income, Mexican American, European American couples in four different counties in California. And they were offered either groups or uh, no intervention. Three quarters of them were married, two thirds of them uh, were below the poverty level in the States. And what we did was we had a control group where the couples were were offered just one meeting that dealt with the idea that fathers are important in their kids' development. So that was the control group. Then there was a group of fathers only for 16 weeks. And then there were groups with couples. All with the same leaders. All with the same leaders. In the control group, the mothers and fathers didn't change or they got worse. Their children's problem behaviors increased their satisfaction as a couple, as we would have expected by now, declined. In the fathers' groups, the fathers became more involved in their children's care, so there were less stereotyped, gender stereotyped parenting roles. The kids' problem behaviors remained stable, so that's good, but the satisfaction as a couple declined. And again, the couples' groups helped the fathers become more involved, reduced parenting stress, kept the kids problem behavior stable, and the parent's satisfaction as a couple remained stable. Again, we would have liked to increase it over the 18 months of the study, but <clears throat> at least it remained stable over time. We did it again, to be brief, with 276 couples that the Office of Child Abuse Prevention said, was this a fluke or could you do it again? The answer was, we could do it again, the results were as good or better than in the first phase. And then in the third phase, we added another wrinkle, another 239 couples in couples groups, also in five counties now with African-American families as well. And these were offered groups that began immediately or a delay control, they began, and they were offered to, you could join a group, but it would take place in six months. But the wrinkle, and we did it this way because half of the families were referred by the child welfare staff. The couples were assessed as, as safe to work together. And so there wasn't any current abuse, but all these couple, half of the couples then had some history of domestic violence and were involved in the child welfare system. And half of the couples were the similar couples recruited and most of them again were low income couples. And what happened in the follow-up after the groups ended, the participants from these groups showed a decline in couple distress, a less conflict, less conflict about their children, less violent problem solving. And this was especially true for
for those who were most in distress when they began. And there was a significant increase in father's involvement, again, in the families, in the groups, compared to the people who had no group. So on the basis of this, we began to be contacted by other people. And so some of these ideas are being disseminated. Carolyn's going to talk about that. So we're, we're running past you with a lot of facts. Um, but I think you can see what some of the central um, issues are and what seemed to be attracting the attention of people in other places um, that we'll tell you about in a second um, was one, the involvement of fathers, which people were realizing wasn't the typical way they worked with families, uh, either low income or already in distress, and a, a focus on the relationship between the parents. And then we have this three generational um, uh, focus as well, as we've been saying. So we, Phil mentioned our colleagues, Marsha and Kyle Pruitt, who live in the Eastern United States and Massachusetts. And um, uh, they, by coincidence, uh, became involved with some people in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. And with their consultation, they set up four sites. Um, they engaged 106 couples and ran groups, trained people and ran groups of the kind we've been talking about. And 12 months after those families entered the study, they found positive effects on the father's involvement uh, on parenting stress, that is, it was lower. There was less avoidant problem solving and less violent problem solving and less conflict between the parents at the end of these groups. The children's problem behaviors were reduced and couple relationship quality stayed stable rather than declining. So here we are in Canada, we happen to be um, originally Canadians, so it's interesting to see that um, families in the middle of Canada um, are having some very similar results. Um, they were not all low-income families there, but uh, they were families working very hard to be parents of young children. At the same time, uh, Phil and I, who have been very active at the Tavistock Center in London, England, uh, over many years and had spent several sabbaticals there, so we got to know their clinicians quite well. Um, that we were giving a talk there uh, about the results of the studies of the kind that we're showing you. And a woman was there from the government and said, um, I want to see if we can make this work here with low income and vulnerable families. And the long and short of it is that for five years, the British government supported a test of this um, uh, supporting father involvement curriculum, but they decided to call it parents as partners, but it's the same uh, curriculum. Um, and the published results now for the first 100 couples who were in more than 10 different sites uh, in England and beyond um, showed these things in a follow up uh, six months after they entered the study. There was a decline in the parents' psychological distress. They used a different measure to measure it called the core. Um, there was a reduction in couple conflict about the children. There was a reduction in violent problem solving between the parents. There was a reduction in parenting stress. And there was a reduction in the children's overall emotional behavior problems. And again, they used a different um, questionnaire than we did to have the parents report the called the SDQ. Um, but it worked there too. And there, there was an increase in couple relationship satisfaction. So for the first time, not only did it remain stable, but um, the leaders in the British groups were able to uh, actually show that the couples increased in their satisfaction. And 55% of the initially unemployed parents when they joined those studies um, got jobs. Uh, a year after. I forgot to say that in, in the Supporting Father Involvement project, there was also a significant increase in income for those who participated in the groups. So um, since then, a number of other interesting uh, things have happened in terms of other people's interest. And um, 
uh, a wonderful psychologist from Malta decided that she wanted to try these kinds of groups, having read about them, um, for parents of babies who were difficult to soothe. And so Ingrid Gresh Lanfranco um, came to London to be trained there at the Tavistock Relationships uh, in the way that we were doing with others. And she has successfully completed a study of a, a random control, controlled trial where some couples were offered groups and others not uh, offered the intervention. And the couples in the groups have shown very positive changes in their relationship, which the control couples did not show. And then um, uh, a couple of clinicians from Poland who knew one of the people trained at the Tavistock also took these groups uh, and started some in Poland. We don't know very much about whether they're assessing them or what their results are yet. And then as we speak, there are some groups in the planning stage uh, led by Naomi Dardick, who was a UC, uh, University of California, Berkeley, Master of Social Work graduate who worked with us for a while. And then she got training at the Tavistock. And so she is uh, beginning to uh, take the groups to Israel as well. It took her two years to find some funding for that, but she has um, managed to do that. So um, one of the things that, that is a key to how the parents are doing, and one of the issues that they tell us is high on their list of what creates conflict is the who does what of their life. So we have um, a question, a involved questionnaire about caring for the children, about making family decisions. Um, and the scale on, on who does what goes this way. Um, if, if they rate each item at the one end of the scale, it means the mother does it all or most of it. If they rate it a nine, it means father does it all or what five means they do it about equally or obviously anywhere in between. And we know now that the division of labor becomes more traditional after having a baby and more traditional than the partners predicted because we asked them in pregnancy what they're expecting. And we have found that the more discrepancy there is between what they predict and their actual division means that um, moms are more depressed and dissatisfied with the, the overall relationship of the couple. And that, as I said, who does what is the number one issue in couple conflict, especially as their families are beginning. And it's not so much how egalitarian the arrangements are. It's not people who have all fives who are doing best, but it's how dissatisfied the partners are with their particular arrangement. So they, they can not be necessarily wanting to divide it equally. But if it goes, if it doesn't go the way they would like it to go, that's associated with both depression and relationship unhappiness, which as we've pointed out, is going to affect the children as well. Um, couple communication and division of labor are sort of a family-based working model of gender relationships we find. So uh, if we're talking about what we can do about all these things, um, a bottom-up approach to changing gender stereotypes um, has to start with a new look at family roles and relationship qualities. And the implications for the workplace, family services, uh, family research, and family policy, um, here's, here's a couple of our thoughts about that. So from the top down, we all know that the workplace reinforces and profits by stereotype gender arrangements by mostly assuming that women will be the primary caretakers of the children. And in many, many places, especially the United States, by not providing adequate childcare or support for alternative arrangements if parents are also going to work. The implication for family services has a lot to do, we think, with the fact that there's a silos problem. Family services tend to be gender stereotyped. They've got set, we've been saying this a little bit already, separate offerings, mostly for moms. And what we see in most family agencies that we've visited in these many counties of California and other places in the United States are that the staff tend to be female. The work tends to happen in daytime hours when fathers or second parents might be working. The pictures on the walls are of flowers and moms and babies. There are women's magazines in the waiting room and only mothers and children's names on the files. So think about what message that's giving 
um, innocently, it's, it's not meant to be the message that only mothers are important, but it does have a quality of suggesting that. Um, the, we think there are implications for family research and interventions as well. And academics are partly to blame for some of this gender stereotyping. For example, there were decades of studies of mothers and children's development, which reinforced the notion that it's mothers that are important, not dads to their children's well-being. And then um, a bunch of researchers took note of this and began to correct it slowly, at least in the United States, uh, over the last three decades. But in the beginning, the focus was on studies of dads and children and not including the, the other parent or the moms. Um, and right now, a focus on couple relationships, parenting, and child development is still pretty rare. It's beginning, and the United States government fortunately in their funding are beginning to take note of some of the results of these studies, um, but it's still fairly rare. And the implications for family policy and people who are thinking of funding um, such projects is still uh, quite a bit in silos. So governmental organizations concerned with the families are also in silos uh, in the sense that there's a Department of Maternal and Child Health there's another department, this is in the United States, for father's support payments and urging fathers to pay support, especially if they've been um, separated from the family for a long time. And now there are there is funding for a bunch of interventions to promote what they call healthy marriage and another set of funds to promote what the government is calling responsible fatherhood. So it's still a lot of siloed um, one by one by one. Um, uh, funding uh, possibilities. But there is a ray of hope um, in the US. Uh, we understand that there's going to be a gender policy council reporting to directly to President Biden. And if we go back to the beginning of our talk about how we can combat gender stereotypes and practices and foster a future in which women and girls participate equally and successfully in family life, um, we think it will take more than a village. So at the family level by involving fathers, as we've been saying, or a second parent and fostering more collaborative couple relationships. At the workplace level, questioning the idea that child rearing is primarily a woman's task. If we want to encourage fathers involvement in child rearing, we really need to provide support for more flexible work arrangements for both mothers and fathers. And at the family service level, to try to eliminate some of these silos and provide more family-based supportive services. At the government level, um, if we could view the family as a whole rather than as a collection of individuals, and if we could learn from the experience of people who've been working in these different silos so that some of the um, learnings are taken to heart, um, then we think that would make a big difference. And here's a thought. Just as we must consider the environmental implications of legislation, or as we consider a Department of Homeland Security, what would you think about a Department of Family Security that over, would oversee new legislation, for example, about child care and health care and what that would do to the security of the family? We're going to leave you with this, which you can have a copy of if you wish. It's some other references to work that we and other colleagues uh, have done on these matters. And we are most open to, I believe we have time for your um, uh, questions and comments. And there is a website for our supporting father involvement um, materials and ideas uh, and findings and so on. And it is a, a, the, on the last slide for you, if you wish it. So we're now open for conversation. Over to you, Ben. Perfect. Thank you all so much. What a wonderful presentation. Um, I must use my reactions. Uh, just so much information and so well presented and organized in a way that makes it really uh, well, as easy as could be condensed and, and made sense of it, and really beautiful research that you all have conducted and building off of what you've learned for families 
and how to intervene in meaningful ways. Um, so we have a, a plethora of questions. Um, one that uh, struck me at the very beginning um, that I was curious about is how is it that you all define father involvement or even parental involvement? What, what does that mean to you all? Is that presence, right? Presence versus absence. Is that taking on specific primary caretaker roles? Um, is that being what part of the disciplinarian structure? Um, you know, it, it seems like such a moving target uh, and such a big crux of, of what you're trying to achieve, right? To get both parents engaged and involved or really multiple parents, right? Engaged and involved, whether they're biological parents or not. Um, so how would you define that or, or what are the ways you would define it maybe is a more appropriate way to ask? Great. Oh, so super a question and so difficult a question at the same time. Um, the first thing is that it's not, not amount of time you spend with your child. That's the one thing that we know for sure from all the research. Fathers, for example, or, or mothers have a, a, a profound impact on kids and can spend fairly little time actively with Paul with them. It's the quality of the relationship. It's the tone of the relationship. Um, second, I would say that each parent, it's very important to have a kind of balance of two kinds of things, warmth and supportiveness. People talk about that all the time, attachment, warmth, supportiveness. That's great, but it needs to come with some limit setting and some um, requests for the child to be mature and to be confident and structured. So it's really a combination of these two almost competing parts that makes for effective parenting. And then the third thing, which is really um, new in research, not new in life, is co-parenting. That Co that the parents need to work out. All parents are going to be different one from each other because they come from different families. And it's a way of working it out um, so that they don't undermine each other. So it doesn't mean that they have to compromise on everything. There's a lot of things where dads can do it one way and moms can do it another if they are have a respectful attitude and work together. So those are my shots on parenting. So it's yes and yes and yes to the things that you mentioned. But um, the, the first key, I think, is getting the message out that father's um, parenting and involvement in the family is equally important to, to the atmosphere that gets created and to what it is that children pick up on. Um, so th that, that's sort of the key to start. And then this, as Phil was saying, the respect for one another's different views. And let's face it, it's very difficult when you and your partner, um, your co-parent disagree about how to handle something, especially if it's going on right now, and one of you is worried about the safety of the child or um, some egregious behavior that you're thinking needs correcting uh, and doing it on the spot is very difficult if you have different ways of approaching it. So if there's an atmosphere in which they've learned to talk a bit more about these kinds of things and maybe give each other the benefit of the doubt and talk about it later, or whether it worked or not and what they might modify just a little the next time it happens, it's that kind of um, collaborative working together that makes a big difference. And the kids, we, we have videotapes of some of the children in our school children and their families project study where we would go, our staff would go to their homes and interview the children uh, over time between the time they were uh, entering kindergarten and going to high school. And some of the kids talked about they got frightened by their parents' loud fighting, but some other kids talked about how frightened they got when their parents 
or in this freeze mode where they weren't speaking to each other or the silence seemed deadly. And I remember one picture particularly, the little girl backed against the dresser in her bedroom, which is where she was being interviewed. And she was saying, when they start that, I just go like this. I, you know, I get so frightened. It's, it's thinking about what you're conveying that the kids are growing up in. Great, thank you both. I, it takes us to another question that was offered by one of the participants today of what are some ways that you suggest in addressing what is often termed as like mother gatekeeping or mother invalidation of the father's interactions with the children? What are some strategies that you found are really effective for that? Well, the first thing that's important is to recognize that it's happening. And one of the things we have a chance to do in these groups that meet every week over many months is to um, talk about those issues and how it seems. And both the moms and the dads get to talk about how it's affecting them or what they're calling, what we call gatekeeping. And sometimes it, it's, it's honestly, it's slightly unconscious on the part of a parent who's worried about the child's safety and just gets adamant about what the right thing to do is and what the wrong thing to do is. So it needs some recognition uh, that this is an issue. And if they're going to uh, work collaboratively, they have, have to develop some strategies for what they're going to do about that. My, my favorite anecdote about that is that in two of these groups, the men meet separately and the women meet separately. And the women are actually talking about gatekeeping in that, in that meeting. And a, a man who had a... a and the men bring their kids for this meeting. And this man had a uh, one and a half year old with a dirty diaper. And he went down the hall and uh, said to, to the mom, uh, you know, his, his, diaper needs his, his diaper needs changing. And all of the women, of course, by the end of this meeting said, no, 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 it's up to you. So he goes back and with the help of the other six or seven men, they use a whole box of wipes, but they change the diaper. Okay, part one. Part two is, and this is really important. So at the end, <clears throat> the men and the women are getting together and the mom says, hey, but you used a, a whole box of wipes. And he says, look, if I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it how I do it. <laughs> um, uh, what we try and, and engender is a respect for the fact that there are different ways, that, that there is no one right answer in parenting. Gatekeeping is often because somebody thinks that there is only one right way. So we have to try and persuade people and persuade them to be experimental a little bit and find, for example, that if the mom says to the dad, can you watch our two-year-old? And she goes away and he, um, he's sitting with a newspaper watching the kid go over to the floor. She comes back and says, I told you to watch him. And he said, I am. <laughs> so so it's, it's kind of giving anecdotes and, and supporting the notion, in other words, that there's, there's something to talk about rather than to argue about. But our attitude, you know, about all of this is this is challenging stuff. I mean, being parents and being partners and being loyal to the families you grew up in, if you still really care to do that, it's a challenging, challenging task. And what they find in the groups is that, the, and most of them mention this years later, if we ask what they remember about having been in such a group, is that they found out that they weren't the only ones who were finding it challenging. And they weren't being stigmatized by being so poor or having um, had a harsh upbringing. So they were being harsher with their kids than they meant to be, that kind of thing. No, that's so interesting. It, it reminded me, as you all were speaking, uh, of a friend of mine who has a shirt that says, I'm the dad, not the babysitter, because so often he would be at the park yeah. Oh, it's so great that you're yeah. babysitting this your child. He said, no, no, right. I'm a parent. Right. So I'm being right. the parent of my child. I don't babysit just, you know, and so it's 
it's that way that we phrase things as a society that fathers are going above and beyond to do the basic tasks mm -hmm. and mothers, it's just the expected requirement of parenting. Um, and he was really, you know, I would be equally offended if someone said I was babysitting my daughter rather than <laughs> fathering my daughter. Um, so, so interesting. Uh, an another question from yeah. one of our participants. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, Caroline, I thought what, you what we've observed is that in these more modern times, when many, many, many fathers are now allowed in the delivery room when their babies are born, that they really are primed to develop relationships with those babies. Um, when I, we have three grown children who have children of their own, and when our third was born in 1965, Phil could not be in the delivery room. So it's since then, it's since the 70s. And there's such potential there. If you watch these dads, and if you look on the streets, they've got their babies in carriers on the front or the back, they're at the park, they're, they're, they're doing all kinds of things with them. And we can capitalize on that. It's not that they're not interested at all. Yeah, great. It, it, so I was gonna go to a different question, but you've linked me really nicely to another question that we received uh, about that biological connection between fathers and children and whether you see there are any kind of differences for your parenting intervention when the father is biologically connected to the child or is an adoptive parent, is a step parent, um, whether you've seen different strategies more effective for biological versus non-biological um, and whether there's some kind of additional connection from being in the delivery room, things that you just were mentioning. Yeah. Okay, this is just kind of controversial territory. Um, we about uh, in the last go round and in a project that we're evaluating in Oklahoma that's similar to ours, um, up to a, about 20% of the people are co-parents who are, are not biological parents. So some of them are even married or you know like remarried after divorce, but some of them are um, dads and grand and grandmothers and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so far, we haven't narrowed it down to just fathers who are biological and fathers not. But our impression is, and the, the data show as a group, that there doesn't seem to be different effects. Uh, depending on the biological connection. I don't mean a biological connection is not important, it is. Um, but so far we haven't, all I can say is that we haven't seen it. And the issues are so similar of the ways, you know, when, when Carolyn is describing these five aspects of life, they're similar for biologically related and non-biologically related. So unless we get down to really fine-grained analysis, which we haven't done, I don't think we'll see overall differences. These dads want to be involved. And uh, if they're biological dads, of course they do. If they're not, they usually have a history of wanting to be more involved than their fathers were with them. And so um, at least for now, we haven't seen a difference. Well, we know that there are all these tricky things like if you're a stepdad um, or a stepmom, you know, in, in a second relationship or marriage, and they're his kids or her kids biologically, that there are all these things you need to learn about timing and, and giving space for the kids to develop a relationship and the, the mother or the father who's biological keeping their main uh, connection with the child and not feeling challenged by it. So there are all kinds of nuances of how to do these things sensitively. But um, even with biological dads, um, you know, they're not all primed to be the most nurturing fathers because of their histories and their personalities. So it varies so much, I think, that that's why we seem to see these things working if people have a space to figure out what they're trying to do and we try to help them do it a little closer to the, the, the goal that they have. 
right? Yeah, I, I can certainly understand how that would be controversial uh, and a difficult issue, right? I mean, in, on one side, it's, it is great that, that anyone can be an effective parent, but we also want to foster connection between, you know, parents and children uh, and responsibility in that, in that relationship. Uh, similarly, uh, a question that kind of builds out of that was whether you've found any evidence of the role of marriage for the co-parents on child success, relationship well-being. Um, is, is there something to the commitment of marriage uh, compared to groups of parents who are co-parenting? Uh, you know, maybe thinking about those who are co-parenting in a romantic relationship but, but aren't married, whether there's any advantages in that uh, comparison. I, I, this is another controversial issue, of course. Um, <clears throat> there are two parts of it. One is, um, and our friend uh, and collaborator in another project, Scott Stanley and Galena Rose, have written a lot about this, the difference between uh, cohabiting parents and marriage. And if you look at it statistically, Um, both marriages, uh, uh, couples who are married are a little bit more likely to stay married than couples who cohabit. And their kids are likely, at least a little bit, um, to do better. But what that research misses totally is the quality of the relationship. And that, that's where something like commitment really does probably make a difference that married parents are more committed to work things through because of the legal arrangements. And so, I, I mean, we're married. I think marriage is a good thing, um, but it really depends. A bad marriage is not a good thing for the participants and the children. So it's not the status of the marriage, it's the quality of the relationship which may be slightly on the whole in favor of married parents versus cohabiting. There's no question that there are researchers and clinicians who believe that married is better yeah. and will have better outcomes. And they can use data from many different studies to suggest that. But um, we're more on the, think about the quality of the relationship and the atmosphere that's being created in this family. Never mind whether there's a marriage certificate or not, because you can find um, well functioning or not so well functioning relationships between parents in both kinds of families. Great. So we'll, uh, I'll go to one more question that will probably be a little controversial, and then we'll switch it up a little bit. But another question that had been raised by one of the participants was whether, you, it, from your pr position in research, mothers and fathers tend to have different kind of traits or abilities that allow them to fulfill certain roles as parents in different ways that you found beneficial or harmful potentially um, through your time. Yeah, again, if you look at, if you look at large scale studies of mothers and compare them to fathers, I think the consensus is that fathers are more likely to be uh, more active, physically active with their kids, both boys and girls, especially boys, um, and more playful. And moms actually tend, because they have the burden more often of the, all of the, or most of the childcare, tend to be a little bit more serious and a lot less playful with the kids. And uh, on the theory that playful is good, that's probably a benefit for having fathers, having somebody in the family who's uh, playful. But again, I think what we're seeing is that there's so much variation and um, that I don't think there's anything other than that, that research has found, you know, Know, really differentiates uh, the sexes. Certainly, moms are not um, 
built in biologically, all of them um, nurturing, know how to be nurturing. And uh, a lot of fathers are very nurturing. So, so there may be on the average some differences, but if you look at families of the kinds that are associated with the people attending here, there's so much variation that I'm not sure it's useful to um, you know, highlight the fact that there, there are average differences, but it's really important to within the family to negotiate the differences that you find. So I think this connects nicely to a, a, another question that we had from the audience is thinking about your um, kind of setup of, of these kind of two different approaches of a bottom-up approach or a top-down approach as to addressing kind of gender roles and gender norms. Um, when thinking about this bottom-up approach, uh, what are you seeing as kind of the likely successful mechanisms to allow for changes in the from this bottom-up perspective in, in the gender roles and kind of a more norming, it sounds like, of men and women can each do a, a majority of these parenting tasks. Um, you know, how do we get to a place where that is acceptable, uh, you know, appreciated, kind of stressed as important? What, what are some steps that could be taken? Well, my feeling of, from doing this over many, many years is that uh, it's like a lot of other things in life these days. Uh, a lot of it makes me very hopeful what I see happening. And then it feels like there's two or three or four steps back, uh, either co coming from the pressures of what's going on in the world or politically uh, or in family policy or family services. Mostly, um, we've had the experience with you know thousands of families now over time and in many different places that most of them are very earnest about wanting to be good, nurturing, caring, thoughtful parents and partners. But it's a huge task. And if they come burdened with um, no good models for how to do that, a lot of them say, I know I don't want to do it the way it was when I was growing up in my family, but I don't know what this other way would look like. And so we try to spend time just slow, trying to slow it down and trying to figure some of that out. So um, I'm, I'm hopeful if we could keep doing things like this in many different places, but every now and then I'll say to Phil, you know, with so many of these interventions going on, you'd think the world of families would be in a much better place than they seem to be. So it's, it's difficult to answer that question generally. I, I think that, um, you know, we, we talk about dissemination of our approach, but our approach is pretty specialized and it needs trained people. So that's not gonna solve the world's problems. But there is something that I think that communi local communities could do, and that is provide more uh, opportunities for parents to get together, not to be instructed about how to be parents, but to have resources, community centers, something. I think that families, again, we're talking from the United States perspective and maybe England, are, are living uh, isolated lives and the COVID has only uh, exacerbated that. But it's, it's, it's pointed, COVID has pointed to a fault line because the number of uh, violence and couple distress is at least by anecdote increasing exponentially as a result of COVID. So places in the community where people are not so isolated, where, where you know, dads and kids and moms and kids and moms and dads can get together to do things. I think that reducing the isolation will put the temperature down. And, and I think putting the temperature down means that, that within the family, that men and women can, can feel freer to negotiate. I, I don't know, it sounds Pollyanna when I'm talking about it, 
Well, but, it's this, but this quality of discovery that you're not the only ones under stress. So the tendency is to say, it's your fault. If you were only more this or less that, we wouldn't be so stressed or we wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't be so, the kids wouldn't be acting out the way they are. It's, it's a more seeing um, the natural course of life in families of parenting and partnering and um, just having some other people to join you in this challenge can really make a difference in your outlook and in how either terrible or pessimistic you feel about how things are or how, well, you know, it was, it was really nice getting together with the families last week at the, whatever it was, barbecue, coffee, clutch. Um, uh, you know, we, we ought to do more of that. It, it humanizes people. And, yeah. and as Phil said, they, they may not feel quite so stressed and isolated. Yeah, you know, I mean, it, it, we've demonstrated in what, seven studies, something like that, that you can help families to balance the parenting roles better. And okay, so that's not going to be available to everybody. Uh, and there are so many barriers, you know, the, the top down part. There's so many things working against it. But um, I guess the only thing I can think of is at the community level, decreasing isolation. So I'm going to combine a couple of questions that were raised uh, and use an aspect that you all had suggested as a possible avenue of moving forward of, you know, Department of Family Security uh, in a, you know, national government. Um, I want us to imagine that uh, Doctors Cowens have been uh, appointed as the uh, leaders of this first Department of Family Security and whether your approach would be to try to prevent the development and establishment of fragile families or to provide better resources and support systems for those families at risk or fragile or in need. Um, where do you see kind of the governmental response? Is it preventing the, the establishment of those types of families or responding with support and resources for those families? Oh, I really welcome that question. And it's, it's a great, important question. Um, first, the government so far has been on the side of trying to reduce fragile families. I mean, there is a, actually in the United States a fragile families project in 20 cities that have followed people over time. But the whole point of it was to see what could happen to reduce that and then the healthy, so-called healthy marriage. Well, at first it was just marriage promotion, uh, but it was to assume that if you could make families less fragile, that would that would help. There, there's not a good amount of evidence that that's so. I think we're on exactly the other side. Families come in all shapes and sizes. The government is really not going to. Uh, randomly assign some people to marriage and some people not um, that we need that we need to help um, people who are raising children to strengthen the relationships in the family uh, not to not, not to prevent that from occurring I don't know what you think well I think what one of the things we were saying is it's going to take efforts on a lot of levels to have, have this happen. There's been a real struggle, I think, in the United States funding as to whether we go for prevention or whether we go, and most of the money for many, many years, even if they believed in prevention, seemed to be going to take care of the most egregious problems because they're, you know, we're desperate to, to stop that from spiraling. Um, and I, I think we'd have to do some of each. It's, it's not either or. Uh, and we just need a kinder atmosphere in which families can do what they're trying to do uh, and a little more believing in people instead of blaming them for their problems. I mean, one woman said in an interview after one of these groups in California some years ago, 
She said, well, the thing about these groups is it's the first place I haven't felt stigmatized for being poor. And you don't tell us so much what to do, but you help us explore why we might be doing things and thinking about things the way we are and to see whether that's working for us or not. And if not, to try to find some other ways. So it, I think the attitude toward families um, to be more compassionate and and understanding of how challenging it is. It's not a simple matter, um, would go a long way. And that and the, obviously such a committee would, ha would have uh, a lot of work to do to figure out, well, what would that mean? What would we have to do? It's, it's a big question. The, the first thing I would do is to take the family, the, the Department of Maternal and Child Health and merge it with them. Rename it at least. Re rename it and merge it with other, with other aspects of the government. I mean, people told us fathers wouldn't come. You know, they they couldn't do these interventions because men are men aren't going to do this. Well, we it, it's a struggle sometimes to get them equally involved. But we have found lots of ways, like having men on staff, which sort of gives the message that this is important stuff for men to be thinking about as well as women. Um, um, just all kinds of things uh, that are more um, conducive to having fathers, mothers, men, uh, married or not, um, thinking about these family things. And one of the things we find that draws them is if they believe that, that doing this might actually help their kids have more optimal development, they will come. Great. That, that was actually my next question that you already answered is, you know, you mentioned that 90% of parents who join these parenting groups often are, are mothers. And so it's great to hear ways to incentivize men and to better advertise. It sounds like this is about improving your child's life and ability to actualize what they will be in the future. Um, and all parents can, can get behind that notion. It's not a male female distinction it is a parent distinction um right. and but what you have to do is you can't sit you can't put an ad for a parenting class in the in the newspaper or the local throwaway newspaper and expect dads to come you need to go out and get them you need to go where dads are you need to go to shopping centers you need to enlist um local media uh, you need to get testimonials from local um, baseball and football players. Uh, you, you, but you, you need to reach out and it does take a lot of effort and it needs to be so that when a mother phones up, for example, and says, well, I'm interested, but I don't think my partner, whatever is, well, can I talk to him? Hmm. Rather than just leave it as, he's too busy, uh, whatever. So, it, and, and having, having uh, groups in the evening, now some parenting classes are like that, uh, having them around potluck dinners. Um, so you need to make flexible times and flexible arrangements if you want dads to come. We provide food or snacks at least, or some food at uh, the beginning of each week of these meetings, and we provide child care. So yeah. it makes it possible for parents to come after work, let's say, uh, decompress, and, and then uh, get together to talk about some of this really serious stuff. Mm -hmm. Great. That's wonderful. Uh, to take us on a slightly different uh, direction, but I think really importantly to thinking about parental relationships and certainly quality of that relationship and well-being, how have you seen the role of pornography impacting relationship satisfaction? Is that something that you all have investigated? Um, no, okay. No, no. So I, I'm just going on what I read, mm -hmm. um, and and that it has, and that clinicians are reporting much more frequently that this is a problem, usually male usually the men mm -hmm. uh, engaging in pornography. I, I think it, it, it I, I'm not talking against pornography as a thing, 
but that obsessive use of pornography can't be helpful. And that what I think it signals, I go kind of the uh, back to the communication with the partners, that, that something needs to be done so that the two people are talking to each other and not feeling so distant that one of them is off with the computers somewhere. But we, it really hasn't come up in it, our- It just hasn't been an issue when we're talking about, you know, parenting babies and young children and trying to get work and make a living and, um, you know, stay in touch with your parents or, or keep them out of your house if they're, you know, doing stuff with your kids that you feel is really dangerous, which we have seen in some occasions. Um, somehow it, it hasn't come up in our experience. Okay. Uh, so we've been focused a lot on parents, but now to think about kind of an intergenerational perspective, how have you seen or have you seen anything about relation, roles of the extended family, grandparents, aunts and uncles, cousins, uh, siblings? Uh, are there aspects that we should be considering you know, fostering or empowering that extended family uh, for healthy child development and healthy family structures. Absolutely, and again, it's a little bit like: um, are they risks or are they protective factors? These these um, extended family members. Mm -hmm. um, most what we found with the, the couples having first babies. So this is the first time, and for some of them, it was bringing a grandchild into the family for the first time. Um, they had all kinds of yearnings to have their parents both appreciate what was happening and join them in the excitement about it. And then there'd be maybe a struggle between whether his parents or her parents were going to visit first and get to meet the grandchild and whether what they were offering in terms of care or help was really caring or helpful. And so all it dramatizes all of the, the quality of those relationships and whether, and so some people were quite disappointed in the beginning at how their parents behaved or didn't. Um, but again, it's very varied and it's just important, we think, to be a little bit more conscious about that stuff and consider it and think about what you really want or are trying to do here um, so that you can make it more manageable. I mean, we worked with one set of really, really young parents of babies um, who were in the health, uh, welfare system because the, these young parents had been using drugs and they either had had their babies taken away from them until they got clean or they were in danger of that. And several of them in, in several different groups at different times came to the conclusion that though they didn't have enough money to move out of their parents' home with their babies, that the, what was going on was so destructive that they needed to do that. And so in one group, one man offered this man who was worried about moving out a job because he didn't have a job. I mean, wonderful things can happen if people appreciate you know, what the, the strains are and are thinking more positively about these generational things. Mm -hmm. But mostly, um, when the couple gets a little more on the same page and a little more relaxed and feeling more effective at parenting, they're likely to be just a little more appreciative of what their parents went through raising them and um, how they might tolerate certain things or talk to their parents about certain things. So it's, mm -hmm. it's possible to foster more generational strength. Um, yeah. Again, if, if there's time to consider all this. Two, two of our group meetings of the 16 were about exactly this issue of what you want to take from the families you grow up in and what you want to change and do differently and what are the issues involved in doing something differently from your parents. So, um, so even in these groups where we've talked so much about the couple, we also trace back, we take an intergenerational view of trying to be more conscious, as Carolyn says, or mindful about what you want and what you are trying to do. I mean, who thought that the, the grandparents would come and they would see that even with this new baby, their children, the grown-up children, the new parents were doing something differently. 
and right. there was feeling on the new parents um, part of that a mother or father was saying, but our way wasn't good enough for you. You know, you have to change it all. And so you, you also to be mindful about that. It might be a challenge. It might be hurtful, or, you know. It, it sounds like what you're stressing again is the importance of open communication, dialogue, and willingness to be exposed to each other and vulnerable and working as a partnership. And when you expand that partnership to extended family members, that the rules still apply of open communication and expectations for everyone in that family unit. Right. Yeah. But if you are going through that and we are talking about the stress in our life around that, and you or someone else in the group says, oh, that was our issue too. Here's what we decided to do. Sometimes you can actually get a good idea of some slight modification that wouldn't mean cutting off, you know, the other generation of the family, but softening it somehow so it's possible to stay connected and still do it in your way. It's really a challenge, but it can be done. Great. Well, thank you so much. This was such a wonderful event. We've gone just a minute over our three o'clock ending time. So I, I don't want to run the risk of getting cut off for our group. Um, thank you again so much, uh, Dr. Cowan and Dr. Cowan. Uh, a wonderful event. Thank you for your willingness to share your slides with anyone who requests. Uh, we cannot say enough how thankful we are. And we look forward to sharing more times to talk about your research and work uh, with our NGO committee on the family in the future. We would really love that. Thank you so much for having us. This was really, really fun. And for being so attentive. Thanks. Great. Well, thank you all. A reminder to everyone that this will be posted on our YouTube channel uh, once we're able to post it up. And we will make sure to email all of our attendees and registrants uh, to know that that's available. And you are welcome to share that with uh, your colleagues uh, and spouses and partners and family members. Uh, again, thank you so much and have a great rest of your day, everyone.